Hey church, my name is John Hagman, senior pastor at First Presbyterian Church in Morganton, North Carolina. Welcome to worship for September the 6th, 2020. We're in the midst of a series called When Love Comes to Town, and I hope it will inspire us to engage each other in our community with the self-sacrificing love of Jesus. We'll be in Matthew's Gospel again this morning, which is all about showing who Jesus is, the long-awaited Messiah, a new Moses, who is the fulfillment of the prophetic promises of the Hebrew Scriptures, Emmanuel, God with us. Matthew shows how Jesus' diverse, multi-ethnic family of faith includes everyone, including you and me. The disciples, the Jewish population of the time, the Jewish religious leaders all had different understandings of what Jesus was all about and who Jesus was. In the sections we'll explore in the next few weeks, Jesus sets different expectations about Messiah and describes what life is like in the upside down kingdom of God, where the godly serve others rather than themselves, choose forgiveness rather than revenge, and gain wealth by giving it away. Like many who grew up in the 1990s, Seinfeld has a special place in my heart. The show about nothing gave us more than a few classic bits and lines. However, one stands out above the rest for me. In December of 1997, George Costanza's father Frank launches into an impassioned story all about the creation of a brand new holiday. He says this, many Christmases ago, I went to buy a doll for my son. I reached for the last one they had, but so did another man. As I rained blows upon him, I realized there had to be another way. Out of that, a new holiday was born, a Festivus for the rest of us. At the Festivus dinner, you gather your family and tell them all the ways they have disappointed you over the last year. Welcome newcomers. The tradition of Festivus begins with the airing of grievances. I got a lot of problems with you people. Now you're gonna hear about it. <laughs> now I'm no Jerry Stiller. So to relive this classic scene, check out the YouTube link in the video description. I don't know about how you feel, but for me, the past several years have felt like a collective airing of grievances in our country and in our world. And while this may be expected and maybe even healthy in some ways, it can be highly problematic. It was true in the 1960s and it's still true today. What the world needs now is love, sweet love. As Christians, this should be our moment. I mean, love is what we do. It's who we are. It's what we're founded upon. But it's been surprising to me that amid all the airing of grievances, cancel culture, and the easily offended nature of our culture, it's my fellow Christians who seem particularly grieved. And typically, our grievances are aired at each other. For those who claim to follow Jesus, those whose entire life's calling is love, to love God and love our neighbors as ourselves, we sure seem to struggle when it comes to loving each other. On April 24th of this year, Jonathan Merritt, a former pastor and contributor for The Atlantic, published an article titled, Christian Cruelty in the Face of COVID-19. He writes this, according to Lifeway Research, 70% of Protestants stop attending church for at least a year from the ages of 18 to 22. And why? 26% said it was because Christian church members were judgmental or hypocritical. And an additional 15% said it was due to church members being unfriendly or unwelcoming. Christians' bad behavior has propped open the church's back doors. And he continues, so Christians' notoriously poor behavior has created a situation in which young people are saturating churches with their absence. Members don't wanna stay, and non-members don't want to start. And that's just young people. The sad truth is most of the growth that churches in America experience is from people who leave one church for another. Now, sometimes that happens in the case of a move, but more often than not, it's the result of an unresolved conflict. In any given group, conflict is inevitable. It's part of being human. It's part of having feelings and minds of our own. But what separates healthy communities from unhealthy ones is how we deal with conflict when it arises. So in a culture where Christians collectively rain blows upon each other, what if we realized there was another way? Fortunately, 
we have a biblical blueprint for handling conflict. Listen to God's word from Matthew chapter 18, verses 15 through 20. Hear the word of the Lord. If another member of the church sins against you, go and point out the fault when the two of you are alone. If the member listens to you, you have regained that one. But if you are not listened to, take one or two others along with you, so that every word may be confirmed by the evidence of two or three witnesses. If the member refuses to listen to them, tell it to the church. And if the offender refuses to listen even to the church, let such a one be to you as a Gentile and a tax collector. Truly I tell you, whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Again, truly I tell you, if two of you agree on earth about anything you ask, it will be done for you by my Father in heaven. For where two or three are gathered in my name, I there, I am there among them. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Matthew's gospel contains the largest portions of Jesus' teachings and show him shaping a new ethic based on Hebrew scriptures, but with a new emphasis on mercy and love. Jesus teaches his followers how to live in light of the good news. Followers of Jesus are called to live in community with one another, to love one another, and care for one another. Now, it's important to note that Jesus says, if another member of the church sins against you. Jesus is not talking about mild annoyances, differences of opinion, or general dislike of each other's personality, although those things certainly matter and can lead to challenges. Jesus is talking about sin, which has no place in the community of faith. Additionally, Matthew records Jesus using family language. Church here can be translated as brothers and sisters. Friends, sin happens, and we can't choose our family. We can sin against each other and not even know about it until the other person tells us. But when that occurs, the loving thing to do is to take it seriously enough to talk about it in private with the goal of restoring the relationship. The goal of a community of Jesus followers is always the restoration of relationships. Having a biblical blueprint is wonderful, but as Iron Mike Tyson once said, everyone has a plan until they get punched in the mouth. When we're offended or someone sins against us, we tend to revert back to our default responses, usually fight or flight. I don't know about you, but I struggle most with this first step. I tend to overlook offenses saying, oh, it's okay, until I just can't anymore. What I intend to be a healthy and grace-filled response can sometimes backfire. I end up overreacting to something insignificant because I've bottled up all those other feelings. Left to my own devices, I chew on offenses and perceive slights. Left to my own devices, I will overthink every angle and come up with every crazy reason why so-and-so hasn't texted me back, answered my phone call, returned an email, liked my Facebook post, included me or invited me to something, whatever. I imagine the worst possible outcome. People don't like me, they hate me, they think I'm no good, and on and on and on. I can get to where I avoid talking to other people when I'm hurt by something, because I'm so afraid of what they might say or do. And that is the complete opposite of what Jesus has in mind for us, isn't it? So, two of the best pieces of advice I've received on this are these. Number one, if it's an offense that can be overlooked, try to imagine the least creepy reason why someone might do that thing. And that comes from Bob Goff and Love Does. Number two, when it comes to perceived sins, keep a short list. Go to that person as soon as you can and talk about it. Having a conversation in private does a few things. First, it makes a soft-hearted conversation possible without public scandal. Nobody likes being called out and embarrassed in public. Proverbs chapter 18 verse 2 says this, A fool takes no pleasure in understanding, but only in expressing his opinion. Going to the other person increases the potential of a restored relationship that can happen through listening and mutual understanding. Secondly, it squashes gossip, and gossip is deadly to a community. Talking directly with someone prevents backbiting and all that comes with it. Jesus' teachings in Matthew reiterate Leviticus 19. Part of loving our neighbor as ourselves is mutual accountability. 
Paul picks up this thread in Romans chapter 13 where he writes this, Owe no one anything except to love one another. For the one who loves another has fulfilled the law. The commandments, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not murder, you shall not steal, you shall not covet, and any other commandment are summed up in the word, love your neighbor as yourself. Love does no wrong to a neighbor. Therefore, love is the fulfillment of the law. Loving one another and handling conflict well ensures that we are keeping God's commandments with the goal of restoring broken relationships. The appeal for two or three witnesses again parallels the teaching of Torah, where eyewitnesses are required for bringing charges. Jesus gives the community, the church, incredible authority and responsibility to help restore an unrepentant person to the community. And Jesus says it has implications on earth and in heaven. The goal is always the restoration of relationships. After all that, if the person remains unrepentant, Jesus gives guidelines for their removal from the community to treat them as Gentiles and tax collectors. At times, the loving response is to remove someone to protect the community. While we are to love and forgive, Jesus' teaching is clear that sin is not okay. And it's not a trite forgive and forget situation. There are consequences for our actions, for ourselves and for our community. If unrepentant, the person is removed from the community of faith. Now I get it. This can sound really harsh. But remember who Jesus hung out with. Jesus spent a lot of time with Gentiles and tax collectors. He was closest to those outside the community of faith. Throughout scriptures, Jesus was always trying to reach people needing their relationship with God and the community of faith restored. It's no coincidence that just before this instruction on handling conflict is the parable of the lost sheep. The good shepherd leaves the 99 for the sake of the one. And upon its return, throws a party with his neighbors and rejoices in the restoration of the flock. We are called to be about loving each other well and handling conflict and sin with seriousness and treating others with compassion with the ultimate goal of restoring one another to relationship in the community of faith. Jesus says that how we do that here has implications now and in heaven. We carry tremendous responsibility and power to handle each other with love and care. When we get this wrong, we give people the wrong impression of who Jesus is and who we've been called to be. When we get this wrong, we lose credibility. I mean, how can we possibly hope to share the good news that following Jesus can bring restoration to our lives and the world if we can't practice restoration among ourselves? But friends, when we get this right, we model what the world needs now more than ever. Love, sweet love. When we get this right in the church, the church remains healthy and can focus attention on God's mission in the world. When we get this right, others take notice and see tangible signs that following Jesus might just be something worth taking seriously. When we get this right, we embody the hope of the world. We show what can happen when love comes to town. Hey, listen, it's not always easy, but it's always worth it. We can be a community of reconciliation. We can handle offense in healthy biblical ways when we seek reconciliation first and deal directly with each other. When love comes to town, we can fight hard for reconciliation without fighting each other.